Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and to participate in this series on the Gospel of Mark. Mark tells us that Jesus taught in parables. In the context of Jesus' day, this word, parables, could mean anything from illustrations to riddles. Illustrations, you know, telling a story or giving an example that makes an abstract idea more concrete. That's what illustrations do. And Jesus' parables can be like illustrations. Often he's trying to teach about matters that are spiritual, even shrouded in mystery. And yet his parables tend to be very earthy and concrete and suggest that even the greatest mysterious truths of the kingdom of God can sometimes be seen or at least hinted at in the workings of nature or human life. Parables could also be like riddles. Like riddles, they intrigued and even entertained. Like riddles, they drew you in and they made you think. Jesus' parables certainly did that. They drew listeners in, in toward engagement with Jesus and his message, but not for everyone. Some listeners seemed to give up too early on the parables, and they drifted away from Jesus' circle of influence. When you heard the parables of Jesus, then you either experienced a spiritual kind of stirring or insight that drew you into the way of Jesus, to Jesus himself, or you were somehow deaf to the words of Jesus, and you drifted further away from him. I think the parables can still do that. They can draw us in, into Jesus' way, into Jesus, or we can just not hear what Jesus is trying to communicate. And this morning, friends, I believe that we want to be hearers, don't we? By the end of the sermon, even starting right now, we want to be drawing close to Jesus and to Jesus' way, not drifting further away, right? And so let's pray. Speak, Lord Jesus. For your servants are listening. Amen. Well, here in Mark 4, we are back in the chapter that Pelham had us in a number of weeks ago when he taught about the parable of the sower and the seed. This morning, we're back to explore a couple of more, forgive me, more seedy tales that, that Jesus tells. Much shorter parables, but boy, they carry their own punch. As Jesus begins his first parable, he says that a farmer threw seed out on the ground. Now it has to be said that this farmer does not seem to be the greatest of farmers because once he throws it out there, he really doesn't do anything else. He just sleeps and gets up, sleeps and gets up all over again. But in spite of what we might call farming by neglect, lo and behold, the the seed sprouts and it grows. Picture a stalk of corn. First the stalk comes out of the ground, and then the ear of the corn is formed, and then that corn matures. At harvest time, an amazing feed of fresh corn on the cob. It's so commonplace, this process of growth, and yet it's so incredible and mysterious. Every time we think about it, if we really think about it, we have to stand back in wonder. Just look at this picture. A big shout out to Sam Masoki, one of our elders, for sending me this picture last week. Uh, Those of you who know me uh, will know that crocuses in the springtime have a special significance, Uh, but what a time for us to be reflecting about growth. Spring started, Yesterday, officially, and even two weeks before spring, when Sam took this picture, in this cold, unforgiving climate of ours, we get to see new life sprouting up. 
It really is an ordinary sort of miracle. I mean, it's been minus 10 some nights recently, and still these beautiful little crocuses defiantly insist on coming up. Who can explain it? So too then, Jesus is suggesting growth in the kingdom of God unfolds mysteriously. It's God-driven. It should provoke wonder on our part. Because God is the one whose power, whose creativity, whose constant care makes that growth possible. There's no other explanation. The farmer can't figure it out. He does not know how, Jesus says. He just tosses the seed out there. And all by itself, Jesus says. That expression, all by itself, is actually automaton in the Greek. It's as if we're on automatic pilot. That seed and the rich, fertile soil that it's a part of, that it's planted in, produces the grain. Friends, growth in the kingdom of God, in other words, growing in allowing Jesus and and his reign and his rule to shape our lives, to have an impact on our world, is a process that's shrouded in mystery. Let's think about it. Somewhere along the line, for those of us who love and follow Jesus, a seed was planted in us. We were given the gift of faith. Our eyes were opened and we saw Jesus and we were drawn to him. I mean, how did that really happen? How did God get through to us? What enabled us to see or to hear at that moment when we really couldn't hear or see before? And why were we able to see or hear Jesus? And other people apparently weren't. It's shrouded in mystery, isn't it? I certainly can't take credit for the new life that God has planted in me, the gift of salvation, Somehow God broke through in my heart and enabled me to hear the words of Jesus. And even now, I have to ask as a disciple of Jesus now, what's going to keep me open to God's work in me? How am I going to continue to hear and see Jesus in my life? What will help me truly be one of those disciples of Jesus who hear, who listen, whose lives are caught up in this process of growth, of transformation by Jesus in me. Growth in the kingdom is shrouded in mystery. It's God's work. And let's not miss the good news here. God is at work. His seeds will grow and flourish. A harvest is coming. Another thing I notice about this parable is that while the process of growth is mysterious and has a divine origin, it's actually quite ordinary. Happens every year. Happens in our day-to-day ordinary world. The parable itself suggests that in the way Jesus tells his seedy tale. He says, night and day, whether the farmer sleeps or gets up, the growth goes on. These four expressions, night, day, sleep, gets up, are actually linked together in the Greek by the word and. And so we could read it, and night, and day, and sleep, and waking up. You see that even the text in this kind of rhythmic use of its words is evoking this sense of the ordinary rhythms of life, night and day, sleeping, and rising. So you see the point? Kingdom stuff happens in the ordinary rhythms of our lives. In fact, that's where Jesus wants spiritual growth to take root in our lives, in the nine to five work a day world, or whatever hours we're working in these COVID days, in the joys and in the struggles of family life, school, sex, play, family, marriage, sports, the arts, 
friendship, the ordinary stuff of being a human being. God wants to be at work in this ordinariness. It's actually the main arena for his work of transformation. I think sometimes we imagine that growth will come more in moments of ecstasy that we experience in worship or or perhaps in prayer. More when we're reading spiritual books or we're off to attend a special conference or a camp or a retreat. That's when God's really going to produce growth, growth in our lives. Now, I have no doubt that God does use all of those things to help us grow. But I think the parable is reminding us that it's mostly in the rhythms of ordinary life that the mysterious work of transformation can take place in our lives. Especially, it seems to me, in the key relationships of our lives and in the inevitable struggles and suffering that mark every human life. There, that's where we can expect God to be at work in us. I was struck last week by Nadine's words of testimony to us. I'm sure we all were. And Nadine, thank you for sharing so powerfully and honestly about your life and your faith. You are truly a teacher in our community, and you are inspiring us and encouraging us in ways past your imagining. Thank you. If you tuned in last week, you heard Nadine talking about her experience of having a terminal cancer diagnosis and the way that's clarified her sense of purpose, her sense of mission. Nadine noted that she's noticing, and I think I got this down word for word, God is using me right where I am and with the people that I touch. Right where I am and with the people that I touch. And surely, friends, while our situations are all very different, the same thing is true for us. God wants to use us right where we are among the people that we touch. And that means that you and I need to be really attentive to have our ears and our eyes wide open to what God is up to in our ordinary days, at home, at work, at school, wherever we might be. And we need to be really expecting, too, that that what's unfolding in our ordinary daily life, what's good in it, what's trying in it, what's joyful, what's frustrating, all of it, it's all rich soil in which God is at work endeavoring to produce growth and transformation in us. You know, these days, my calling is is to accompany people on their spiritual journeys, to meet with them and talk with them about what God is up to in their lives. I think about a couple of people I met with this week. You know, the main way I tried to help people this week, and in these cases, there were people very involved in religious stuff, and really, the main way I tried to to help, help these folks was to lead them to see how God is really at work in their domestic lives, where they really live, the people whose lives they really touch. That's what's most holy in your life right now, where God is most powerfully at work. Don't miss it because it can seem so mundane or ordinary. You know, I think our second seedy tale, the parable of the mustard seed, actually picks up on some of these same themes. The mustard seed, the smallest seed used by farmers in Jesus' day, would actually produce the largest bushes in a garden, sometimes six to eight feet high. One commentator, Marie Sabin, notes that Jesus' audience would have been very surprised in the first place that Jesus would even mention mustard seeds or plants. They were just so common. Apparently, they still grow in abundance around the Sea of Galilee. So again, Jesus seems to be suggesting 
that when it comes to growth in the kingdom, God's work often starts in the small and in the ordinary, like mustard seeds. You know, sometimes I think we all can feel that our lives are are pretty small and insignificant, that what we do is pretty ordinary. Friends, let's not make the mistake of thinking that God is somehow only interested in the big and the dramatic. I love what Brother Lawrence says. You remember him with his spirituality of pots and pans, his wonderful testimony that God consistently met him and delighted in his service in the kitchen, in a monastery. Brother Lawrence writes, we ought not to be weary of doing little things for the love of God who regards not the greatness of the work, but the love with which it is performed. And so, you know, I think about young mums, and and I think about grandmums out there. I think of the hours of loving devotion that you give to your children or grandchildren. An ordinary calling in one way, a calling that I know can feel routine and, and mundane, but one so many of you do with extraordinary love. I think, too, of the often overlooked work that many do in caring for elderly members in their families. Ordinary work with extraordinary love. It's work that can have the kingdom of God written all over it. Those of us in the workplace, our ordinary nine-to-five jobs, We're not working in the limelight, but as we do our work well with our abilities, with the genuine desire to serve others and to serve Jesus, as we treat those in our workplace with with love and respect, whether we're teachers or plumbers, real estate agents, nurses or hairdressers, God can help us do the ordinary with extraordinary love. The kingdom of God can come to life in our workplaces. The mustard seed was a very small seed. The mustard plant was a very ordinary, commonplace plant. God's work can start in small, insignificant things and yet produce results beyond our imagining. I know that one of our elders, JB, was part of a small group who who had the very first vision for offering a meal to the needy in our cities on Sunday evenings. And Sunday suppers for decades now has been a powerful ministry that reaches hundreds of people every week and engages many churches in the HRM. Amazing things can happen. A few people get together to share and pray, praying for God's work among Arabic speakers here in Halifax, and now a community of Arabic believers meeting together and reaching out into that community. A small group gathers around a refugee family. Incredible things can happen that change people's lives. You see, when it comes to God's kingdom, things aren't always as they seem. In fact, they rarely are. What seems small and and inconsequential is in fact strong and influential. Last week, Shrant and Ginny Manuel did our pastoral prayer. And uh, I know that when Shrant was studying theology, God planted a seed in his heart. That powerful passage in Matthew 25, where Jesus tells us that when we are doing something for the least of our brothers and sisters, we are doing it for him. That verse took root in Sean's heart. He knew that there was a call on his life in some way. And for years, he nurtured that seed, not really knowing what God would do with it. Well, many years later, God called he and Ginny to found a ministry in India and Nepal, And now, through Far Corners Ministry, pastors' children are being educated. The hungry are being fed. The gospel is shared. Ministry leaders are being trained. Relief packages were sent to the poorest 
of the poor during the early days of the pandemic. Amazing. It started with a seed planted. It's been so great to see this banner here over these last couple of months. Beautiful, colorful banner. And um, it was actually Sean and Ginny who enabled us to make our first contact with the boys' home in Sikkim in India. A seed was planted, a mustard seed really, and now 13 years later, Many of these boys in Sikkim have had their lives transformed, and we as a congregation have been challenged and been transformed. It all starts with a small seed in the kingdom of God. Things are not always as they appear. The smallest seed becomes the tallest plant. You know, if you think about it, That's what it was like for Jesus, wasn't it? From a human perspective, his work seemed so insignificant. A small band of disciples from the boonies up in Galilee were the only ones who seemed to get what Jesus was up to. And in fact, most of the time, they didn't get it. The religious leaders of Jesus' day totally missed it. Jesus' own family didn't get it. They rejected him. Jesus ends up dying the most degraded of deaths. And forgive me, this laughable, strange excuse for a Messiah is laid in the ground. A seed, a seed that enters the earth and dies. And from that small seed, new life, a resurrection, an incredible spiritual harvest. Now the crowd who heard this new Rabbi Jesus tell these parables could never have guessed it. Remember that quote from last week that Ross introduced us to. Jesus, the expected Messiah, comes in the most unexpected way. In fact, those who first read this Gospel of Mark that we've been reading and studying were a small group of oppressed first century followers of Jesus. They were persecuted. They were on the margins of their culture. They must have looked at Jerusalem with its religious heritage and pomp, at Rome with its incredible military power and political power, and wondered what in the world is this tiny little movement that that we're a part of, what does it really have going for it? Little could they have imagined What a powerful impact Jesus, this seed planted in the ground, would have on this world. I mean, think of it. Jesus has many critics today. But even in our secularized, Christ-ignoring, Christ-haunted world, no one can really suggest with any seriousness that there is any other person who has had such a profound impact on the culture of Western civilization. No one. It all started with a small seed planted in the ground. Jesus' death unleashed resurrection power, a new creation, and that new power is still at work in the world, and its work often starts with a small, insignificant seed. Jesus notes that the mustard seed eventually becomes a plant with big branches and birds, the birds of the air, can perch in its shade. Jesus is actually alluding to some Old Testament verses in Ezekiel where the trees with their branches were used to represent the great empires and kingdoms of the world. And given these Old Testament references, many scholars agree that that Jesus is alluding to the fact that one day many nations will participate in the worldwide reach of the gospel. The church of Jesus Christ, as Tom Wright says, has offered shade to the whole world. It's an incredible story. But you know, we need to be careful, don't we? Because there's no promise of triumph or immediate results in this parable. In fact, there's a certain irony at play 
here in Jesus' parable. You see, in the Old Testament, the great empires were pictured as huge, impressive trees with massive branches. They were like the cedars of Lebanon. And that's kind of what we'd like Jesus to say. From the seed I've planted in you, I'm going to grow you into one of those massive redwoods that you see out in British Columbia on Vancouver Island. 300 feet high, 30 feet in diameter. But no. In the parable, it's a relatively modest mustard bush. Maybe 10 feet high. I think Jesus is tipping us off that while the work of his kingdom will experience surprising results, powerful in their own way, it often won't look like the power of earthly kingdoms. Many will still not be impressed with the kingdom of Jesus. There'll be no military parades, no fighter jets flying overhead. Jesus' kingdom will be powerful, but it might not look the way you think it will. That's the mystery of growth in the kingdom. David Garland writes, We tend to be overly impressed with mass movements and high-powered organizations, but these parables that stress the ambiguity of the presence of the kingdom of God in the midst of this current evil age should caution us against this mistake. Jesus' picture suggests that the kingdom of God may continue to look like a failure. The tiniest of seeds becomes the greatest of all shrubs, but a shrub is still a shrub. The parable, he says, may be a rebuke to those expecting something grandiose from God. The kingdom will not fit our expectations and specifications. No, Remember that the kingdom of God is often at work in the everyday and in the ordinary. It's work that can often be quiet and silent, like a seed growing under the earth. The work of the kingdom can seem marginable and vulnerable. It can even, David Garland says, continue to look like a failure. But that's in our human eyes. We forget the God whose strength can be made perfect, complete, in our weakness. We forget that God doesn't seem to mind when things seem to take time, a lot of time, to unfold. Sometimes the deepest changes in our lives and in our culture can take the longest time to unfold. And there's a lot of trust in God as we wait. And yet the work of the kingdom is going on. It's continuing. You know, one of the things I've learned as someone who came to gardening later in life has to do with what happens when you introduce new plants into your garden. I learned about a saying for gardeners, and the saying goes like this. First year, sleep. Second year, creep. Third year, leap. It's often not until the third year that a new plant will really begin to flourish in a garden. And sometimes in God's garden, in God's kingdom, it's a matter not of years but of decades before that season of harvest comes. Whether that's in our families, our churches, our world. But friends, we take great heart this morning Because these parables are not ultimately about our efforts, our activity. They're about God and God's activity. God plants the seeds. It's his work. And he will produce the harvest that he intends in this, his world. And in our hearts and lives. This we can know. And in this we can rejoice. Amen. A couple of questions, friends, for you to talk about in your agape groups or if you're just gathered in your living room in a family setting. Two questions. The first is this. Think about your life 
I want you to get really practical here. What is one area where you can see the kingdom of God at work in the ordinary rhythms of your life? Share about that. And then two, Jesus points out that his kingdom often starts in small, inconspicuous ways, yet grows into something fruitful. Have you seen this principle at work in your life or in the life of the church? So share stories together about what you've witnessed. Thank you.